Good morning and welcome back. We are on site this morning at St. Paul's Lutheran Church of Jewell, Iowa. And last week we recorded at Salem in Radcliffe, Iowa. But we're glad to have you back and let us begin our service this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you pray with me? O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray that you will open our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that through the preaching of your word we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and in death, and to grow day by day in grace and in holiness. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. In the book of 1 John, we, we hear from God, and, and he says to us, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Every one of us has sinned against our, our Lord and our Maker, and so I invite you to join me in confessing our sins together to the Lord. And I have a confession here that I'll use, and so if you just want to listen along and, um, and see that this is something that you confess from your heart as well, would you join me? Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake. Grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And in that same passage in, in 1 John, we hear that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our, us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so if you have confessed your sins to the Lord today along with me, hear this promise that he is faithful to forgive you and to cleanse you of those and, and this is the good news for you, that Jesus has already paid for every one of those sins. And because of his finished work for you, I tell you the good news, that your sins are forgiven. Believe this promise of God and receive his grace and goodness in Jesus. Amen. At this time, I invite you to gather together with any of those that are assembled with you, or if you're, if you're by, alone, by yourself and, and alone at this time, just grab your Bibles and, and read the passages that I'm going to put up on the screen for our scripture texts today. This is the word of the Lord. Would you join me in confessing our common faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, our sermon text for this morning is Psalm 31. And if you would turn in your Bibles there with me, if you have those available, Psalm 31, and we're going to be reading just a few verses at a time as we go through much of this chapter here. And before we begin, let's say a quick word of prayer. Oh Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth, and we ask that you would sanctify us in your truth. Please, Holy Spirit, come and work in our hearts to lead us to repentance of our sin and unbelief. And we pray that you would lead us to repentance, to look to Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And would you join me in, again, Psalm 31, and let's take a look first at verses 9 through 13. And as we do that, 
I want to point out that that these are some verses that you might be able to really relate to right now in, in our current situation. And uh, as I speak to you, I, I think of how I know a number of you are in tough places right now. I've spoken with a number of you that are feeling distressed or trapped. Some of you are going through very hard things, just separated from loved ones or, uh, or, or many other challenges that are before you. And I want you to hear in this that you are not alone. We're going to get to see in this psalm that David, that, uh, that this psalm is from, could relate to situations similar to ours. And, and there's also someone else that can relate to us, but we'll get to that later. And, and so let's start here. We're jumping right into the middle, notice, here to the, in this chapter. Um, to the point that, that uh, we can maybe start with in, in relating to. So verses 9 through 13. It says, Be gracious to me, O Lord. Notice this is a prayer to God. Why? For I am in distress. My eye is wasted away from grief. My soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity, and my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel, for I hear the whispering of many, terror from on every side as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. Look again at this and, and see the things that we can connect with. Uh, being in distress, how many of you are feeling distress because of COVID-19 and, and thinking of, of the anxiety that many of us have? In fact, uh, there are so many examples of, of ways that uh, we can see that people are distressed right now uh, with with people needing to go with different coping mechanisms, like even just turning off the TV and or only checking the news every so often because uh, people are, are getting sick or uh, overwhelmed with worry because of seeing what's going on. People are feeling uh, cooped up, getting cabin fever. Uh, some people are, are living in fear about uh, everything that they touch, every person they come in contact with. And, and there's great distress. Uh, my eye is wasted from grief. I, I've, I, like I mentioned, I've talked to some of you and, and uh, even shed some tears with some of you that are going through tough things. For example, right now, uh, many who have a loved one who has COVID-19 or is hospitalized for some other reason, those people are being separated right now. And, and uh, how painful it is when we have a loved one in the hospital, or maybe we are even that person in the hospital, and we're now not only sick and dealing with uh, something very traumatic, maybe even life-threatening, but, but we're even now cut off from all of our family and friends. And, and I know uh, some of you are, are finding your eyes wasting from grief. And he says, my soul and my body also. And, and so, uh, many people are sick, uh, right now across our world and and feeling this great distress of, of soul and body. And he says um, that his life is spent with sorrow and his years with sighing. Maybe you don't know what else to do right now, but let out a big sigh. And, and uh, he talks about he has all these adversaries around him. They're, they're scheming together uh, around him, verses 11 through 13, and, and maybe this virus is the thing that feels like it's your great enemy, or there's maybe some other uh, uh, colossal challenge that is surrounding you right now. And he describes here uh, something interesting, being becoming a reproach, especially to his neighbors, and an object of dread to my acquaintances, those who see me in the street flee from me. I was just hearing from somebody uh, who was telling a story about trying to get used to going out 
uh, into public now at grocery stores, running errands, these things, uh, since we're all supposed to be staying inside and uh, pe many people are on edge. And, uh, and yet sometimes we, when we're out, we can let our guard down, not realize uh, or forget maybe a little bit the situation. Uh, some of us maybe could do that uh, even by accident. But, uh, but then seeing people recoil, I don't know if you've had that experience where you come by and, and maybe you're used to shaking hands or, or just being close to somebody and, and uh, they're, they're so on edge that they back away from you quickly and, and don't want anything to do with you. Uh, David apparently experienced that for different reasons. Uh, but that's, a, that's a, a disheartening thing when we can't have close contact, when people are repelled by our very presence. And it can just be a very lonely feeling. And uh, he mentions in verse 12, I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have, and, uh, and maybe you are feeling like you've been forgotten. I know a number of you are, are feeling very isolated. Maybe you live alone. Um, or even if you have a family like I do, it can be easy to just feel totally cut off uh, from the rest of the world when we're trying to stay in. And, and maybe you're feeling forgotten. Another way that uh, a lot of these things can happen is actually if you are one of the, the workers that is still out there working every day and thank you, God bless you, we need you and we appreciate you. And, and I recognize that even in the midst of you being in your work out in public and doing these things, if you're a hospital worker or something like that, I recognize that you can feel surrounded on every side, like you have enemies uh, coming in uh, around you and, and pressing on every side, and maybe you can even feel like one who is forgotten, uh, like, like you are alone without any help in the midst of uh, a very um, oppressive situation or chaotic situation. And uh, David could understand that too. He was, uh, the, maybe the situation that David's referring to in this psalm is when he was fleeing for his life from King Saul and he was hiding in caves, he was running around, he had an army chasing him. And, and it, he describes hearing the whispering of many terror on every side, verse 13, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. And so as we think about these things uh, more and, and consider our situation too, and whatever distresses it is that you have, notice what David is doing here. He is going to the Lord in prayer. Let's, let's see a little bit more in context what he's doing and go back to verse 1 and see this prayer that he has. I'll read the first two verses here of chapter 31. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. So he's, he's having a prayer here, a, a cry for rescue. He wants to find refuge in God. And he says in verse 2, Incline your ear to me, rescue me speedily. This is an urgent prayer request that he has for the Lord. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. And so he's praying to the Lord and asking for a rescue. Notice next, he, he goes from this prayer uh, for help to praising the Lord and, and putting his trust in, in who God is. And, he, and so in verse 3, he says, For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. And maybe you recognize that, that famous phrase, into your hand I commit my spirit. Something that we talk about doing uh, at the end of our life when we when we give over our spirit to the Lord and, and we say that we're trusting him even at, at the end of our life. But this is something that I want you to see that you can do in every area of your life and every day of your life to commit your spirit to the Lord. David found that he could do that and he found 
that God was a great refuge for him, a safe place, somewhere he could go and hide and, and where God would rescue uh, him out of the net that was set, the trap that was set for him. God would take him out of these perilous situations. And he goes on uh, after that, after committing his spirit to the Lord, praising the Lord, saying, You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. And that, that word redeemed means to purchase or uh, save out of slavery and to release from from this oppressive situation. And God has redeemed David, and he is a faithful God, the Lord, it says here. And he is that for you as well. And we're going to hear more about that as we go along here. In verse 6, he, he comes into another little section, and he, he says uh, something curious. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols. David was so frustrated with people who would foolishly go after something that wasn't really God, that couldn't really help them, and he hates that. And he hates people who would do that. But he says, I trust in the Lord. And, and he knows who to go to. In verse 7, I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love, because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul. And you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. That's a picture of, of safety, being able to look far and see that there are no enemies, nothing coming to hurt you, nothing hiding around the next corner, but a safe place. And, and David recognized that the Lord had heard his prayers, that the Lord had seen him in his distress and I want to tell you, too, that the Lord sees you, even if you feel forgotten. The Lord sees you, even if you feel isolated and alone in your home. The Lord sees you. He knows your situation. Even if you are in great distress of your body, feeling overwhelmed by all sorts of things pressing in on you, the Lord sees you, and he helps you, and he is going to deliver you out of these the Lord wants to help you right now in this physical situation you find yourself in. But I want to uh, lead us eventually here to see the ultimate deliverance that God has provided from every single kind of trouble that we come across. And uh, notice here, uh, it, as we jump back into this middle section that we read at first, that David recognizes in verse 10 that the situation that he is in is, is something that is the cause of, uh, or is because of chaos and, and other people attacking him, uh, maybe King Saul in this case, uh, definitely something David went through in his life, but also that, that there was something else that was a cause of these problems. In verse 10 he says, my strength fails because of my iniquity, his sin. His, uh, his rebellion and, and the things he had done to break God's laws and to offend God were the cause of this. And brother and sister, you, you and I have also sinned against the Lord, and, and all of mankind has. And really, as we think about this situation that we're in with COVID-19 and the, being a, a particular enemy that we're fighting right now, um, also, the troubles uh, with the economy, that could be something that is really um, actually hurting you, or maybe the fear of that is really hurting you, and, and all of these other things. All of these broken, bad things in our world are ultimately because of our sin. When God created the, the heavens and the earth and mankind, uh, he said that it was very good. And we look and, and see that the world had been perfect. But Adam and Eve, our forefathers, our, our, our first father and mother, um, they, they rejected this place of peace in favor of their own way. They sinned against the Lord. They took this beautiful creation that God had and corrupted it. And, and all of their descendants after them, including us, 
have been born sinners. And every one of us has sinned against the Lord, too, and in our own actions. And so we are not only born corrupt in our hearts with sinful desires, but we have acted on those and, and we contribute to this broken situation in our world. And so uh, even, even problems like sickness and the world falling apart are because of our sin. And so we've got to, we've got to own up to our part in all of this and recognize that uh, we are not without fault. And, and to cry out to the Lord for help and to confess that to him. In verse 14, then he goes on after, after, again, going over these many distresses he has. And he again puts his trust in the Lord. And he says, you are my God. Notice verse 15, my times are in your hand. Isn't that great that we can say that, that, that our times are in God's hands. He knows the number of our days. He knows the number of, of breaths that we will take in our life and all of our times are in his hand. And he says, rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Let's jump down to verse 19 and see uh, what, what uh, happens after this. David says, oh, how abundant is your goodness. Notice he's now reflecting on what God has given him, even in the midst of all of this trouble. He says, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you in the sight of the children of mankind. And so God has, has blessed us in so many ways. We can even count our blessings even in the midst of this trial. Jump again down to verse 21 with me. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me. When I was in a besieged city, maybe that besieged city is your house. You feel like everywhere outside of your house isn't safe. Maybe if you work in a hospital or something, you feel like you are in a besieged city. But God has wondrously shown his love, steadfast love to me when I was in a besieged city, David says. He says, I had said in my alarm, this is verse 22, I am cut off from your sight, but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. And I just want you to hear that once again, that even if you feel cut off from everybody else or especially from God, that he has heard you in your cries for help. And if you haven't cried out yet, I want to tell you that he will hear you if you cry out to him. I want to jump now to the New Testament as we think about uh, how God has answered our prayers. In Matthew chapter 21, we, we hear about Jesus' triumphal entry. And uh, this is Palm Sunday, and, and uh, maybe you're very familiar with this passage of Jesus as he, he tells his, two of his disciples to go out into this village and, and to bring in this donkey and a colt and to bring them to him. And he, he then uh, mounts up on this donkey and, and rides into town. And it says in Matthew 21, verse 4, this what took place, I mean, this is a curious situation, so why did this take place? This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. And, and we can read this in the Old Testament, the, the, the passage that we read earlier in this service, from Zechariah, uh, this, to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And what a curious situation this was. If we had experienced this and, and not understood the context of it, uh, we would think this was very bizarre and and maybe not all that impressive. We'd wonder why all the people were uh, waving these palm branches and crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. But you see, God had heard the cries of his people throughout history. He had heard his people in Egypt 
and he had set them free from that. He had heard his people who were in, in exile in Babylon, and he had brought them back. And as he was reestablishing them in Jerusalem, he had given this prophecy. This was uh, over 500 years before this account in Matthew that, that he had prophesied that this would happen. So this was a very specific fulfillment where God was answering the prayers of his people and fulfilling a promise that he had given to them, that he would send the king, the savior, to them, who would overthrow all the powers that were against them. And so Jesus, as he rides in on this donkey, he is, he is the answer to your prayers. He is the one God has sent to save you. As a little bit, uh, maybe more detailed description of this, kind of behind the scenes, what's happening as God sent Jesus, I want to look at Philippians chapter 2. If you want to flip there with me, Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. And notice the connections to these other texts that we've been reading today. It says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Remember that he had, had come in uh, on this donkey in a meek and humble way. And so Jesus, even though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God some, a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. You know, a donkey was a, a beast of burden. A horse would have been an oppressive thing for him to come in if he was going to be making war. But he came in on a donkey, a humble way to serve and to work for you. And, and how did he do this? It says, going on here, he but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And we remember how Jesus was born as a little baby, uh, and he is a true man. In verse 8, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. And obedient, it says, to the point of death. His service, this work that he came to do on this donkey, was to go and serve you even to death, even death on a cross, it says. And so Jesus, this, this humble servant who comes in this very peculiar way, fulfilling a very specific promise to answer your very specific prayers in your very specific situation of need, in the need that you have of loneliness or fear or being overwhelmed, but most especially, and in, in the greatest way, the needs because of all of your sin, that you have, have needs that are eternal, and Jesus came to meet every single one of those in, in the most ultimate way, by becoming obedient to serve you until death, even death on a cross. Listen here as it finishes this thought, and it says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the na at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so we think back on, on that beautiful day when Jesus rode in on that donkey and, and the people waving those palm branches saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And their praise was right to give to Jesus, our Savior, the Lord. And one day every knee will bow before him. I just want to close going back to the last couple verses of Psalm 31. And David says this as he applies this chapter to us. He says, Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. So David's telling us, don't act in pride. The Lord will repay you for that too. But 
For those of you who are faithful, putting your trust in the Lord, the Lord will preserve you. He encourages you in this last verse, be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. The Lord hears you, the Lord sees you in your situation, and he has answered your prayers and your cries in Jesus. If you are still holding out yet and haven't called out to the Lord, I want you to hear too that the Lord will hear you if you humble yourself and cry out to him. The Lord will hear you and answer your prayers too, and he has already provided Jesus for you. Amen. Would you join me in praying our Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.